to our participants from the U.S. and Europe, and welcome to the Markets 3 session of the ESIG 2020 Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop, being held online on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the month of June. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As most of you know, we were originally planning to do our annual forecasting and markets workshop in Denver this month, but due to the coronavirus situation, we found it necessary to move the workshop online. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG offerings committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and co-chaired by Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become members and get involved if you haven't already. Regarding logistics, I would ask you to note that the webinar will be an hour long. We will have three individual presentations, and we plan to hold the questions for a 15-minute question and answer session after the last speaker. We're trying something a little different for the Q&A going forward. Attendance, <clears throat> attendees are requested to ask their questions through the Slido platform. You will not be able to ask your questions through WebEx. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter June 23rd, J-U-N-E 23, today's date, as the event code to ask questions of the panelists. Please indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. The instructions are also in the webinar announcement at the bottom of the registration box on the website, and you will be reminded by the session chair. You will see a thumbs up button next to the question to allow you to help prioritize the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we will address them at the end. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with typically more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted, so again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with June 23rd as the event code. Today, we're hosting the Markets 3 session on control and dispatch of hybrid resources, chaired by Paul Sekowicz of EQ Policy Associates with James Pigeon of the New York ISO serving as co-chair. Paul is president and founder at EQ, consulting in the areas of wholesale market design and operation including issues associated with high penetrations of renewable energy. James is the manager of distributed resources integration at the New York ISO. Both are active participants in ESIG. Paul will manage the session logistics and James will handle the Q&A. I've known both Paul and James and worked together with them for a number of years now and consider them both good friends. Paul and James, we appreciate having you here and I'll now turn it over to you, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that kind introduction, Charlie. And before we get started, um, since we only have an hour of time here, I'm going to uh, we have three presentations, and I'm going to limit the presentations to between 12 and 15 minutes, probably more on the lines toward uh, 15 minutes. That way we have a minimum of 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer for Q&A, which I think these presentations will generate quite a bit of. And so before we get started, I'm going to introduce all of the speakers at once so that we can kind of just uh, continuously move on through through the presentation so we can get to the Q&A. So first, our first presenter is going to be Matt Rippey from NextEra Energy, or NextEra, excuse me, Analytics, uh, where he focuses on uh, on optimization of energy storage. He's worked on uh, behind the meter, uh, commercial industrial dispatch algorithms, automated market participation, and so on. And he's going to be talking about a model called the HERO. And if I would have known that, uh, he was naming his model Hero, I probably would have queued up a little bit of Foo Fighters uh, from the song by the same name. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that presentation, Matt. Our next presenter is going to be Hong Yu Wu, who's an assistant professor and uh, the Michelle Munson, Simu Keystone Research Faculty Scholar in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at, at Kansas State University, the Little Apple. Uh, and before joining K-State, he was working at NREL, so one of the many NREL alumni that are out there working in this space. And on you, we're happy to have you here. And he's going to talk about uh, distribution LMP, uh, among, among the other things that he's worked on, such as uh, power systems planning and operation and cybersecurity. And finally, batting cleanup, no, we only have three hitters, only, not four. We have Mark Alstrom, who's the vice president 
for Energy Policy at Nextera uh, Energy Resources, and he's also the president of this austere group of, of ISIG. Um, and he's worked it, in this area for many years. He and I have worked together at IEEE conferences and have had some very spirited conversations. And Mark is going to talk about hybrid energy resources today, where uh, we can actually see maybe we don't need new products, but just new ways of thinking about how we utilize these resources. So with that being said, I want to turn the floor over to Matt uh, to have him get started. Matt, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you, Paul. Um, I appreciate it. And I, I didn't bring my, my spandex, I guess, for the, the hero uh, talk. But, but as Paul said, my name is Matt Rippey. I'm an operations engineer uh, for NextEra Analytics. And I've focused mostly on uh, the economic optimization of storage resources. Um, and, and I wanted to talk about this for, for this panel because this is a, a tool that we're building now. And, and to give you guys a little bit of context, NextEra is uh, is, has, has contracted for several hundred megawatts of, of hybrid energy resources in the next few years and has a lot more in the pipeline. So, so we are actively looking for ways to better dispatch and better manage these resources. And so we had looked at a lot of different tools that we could potentially use for this. Um, and, and I was running through this presentation actually last night with, with my wife and she compared this to uh, a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which I thought was, was very accurate. It's, it's the scene where King Arthur is he's looking for the Holy Grail and he goes up to this castle to, to ask these two knights uh, if they can help him. And he asks and the one knight turns to the other one and says, tell, tell him we've already got one. And then he just yells down, we've already got one. And I don't think it's that these tools were, were bad or that they lacked any sophistication, but, but there, there aren't many of these resources in operation. So there aren't a, a whole lot of, of, of opportunities to test uh, uh, this sort of optimization. And the, the participation models for these, these resources are changing. So, so eventually we, we came to this realization and, and we realized that we, we already had a lot of the pieces that we would need to put into this optimizer. And so uh, that's how the, the hybrid energy resource optimizer, uh, or as we lovingly call it, HERO, uh, was born. Um, so this is this is sort of what I'm going to go through, and, and I'm going to start with an an overview of NextEra. Um, NextEra Energy is a large renewable energy developer in in the U.S. and in Canada mostly, and uh, I think this isn't all of the the businesses that are a part of NextEra. Uh, however, I I was trying to get sort of a cross section of, of different businesses that might be impacted by the growth of variable energy resources and and the increase of, of uh, hybrid energy uh, resources as well. Uh, we do own and operate 17 gigawatts of wind and solar, and, and roughly 25% of the, the energy we as a company generate annually is comes from variable energy resources. Uh, NextEra Analytics is a smaller part of that company. Uh, we work in all of these business units and try to find optimization solutions for, for difficult problems that other business units are, are, are facing. And, and as such, uh, we, we kind of separate our, uh, our products that we support into three different areas. Uh, one is to find and prospect new potential sites. Uh, one is to design those sites. And then where the hero tool would sit is in this, this operate section. And this is where historically we've, we've uh, helped develop trade strategies, we've helped uh, to come up with dispatch algorithms for batteries, helped with operational assessments, and things like this. Uh, so the, the HERO tool fits in, in this sort of realm. Uh, I pulled this from, from the grid integration workbook that I think a few of our, our ESIG colleagues have worked on. Um, but this shows that across regional power systems, you see a growth of variable energy resources year over year um, that, that's very rapid. And uh, in, in some markets, we, we've seen for short durations, over 50% of the load is supplied by variable energy resources. And as this renewable penetration is increasing, our, our unit commitment capabilities and our scheduling capabilities aren't necessarily keeping pace with that. And uh, in addition to, to needing to handle now a, a large influx of variable energy resources on the grid and a large penetration of that, uh, 
We also have uh, a huge uh, upcoming of distributed energy resources as well. And a lot of these unit commitments uh, packages won't uh, scale efficiently to be able to take the thousands or tens of thousands of new devices that are required uh, to, to, to schedule efficiently the, the uh, distributed energy resources. And so that's where HERO comes in. This is a product that sort of sits between the, the individual resources that are being dispatched and the system operators uh, that are controlling the, the scheduling and dispatch uh, of, the, of those resources. We aggregate the, the different resources, the capability of the different, different resources together so that we can then provide a, a cost schedule or a cost curve for uh, any arbitrary bundle of those resources that's provided to a system operator or a, a market operator. Uh, that market operator in turn provides a dispatch. That dispatch is then disaggregated again out to all the, the resources in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, the HERO tool has a few different features and we've broken it down into these four, uh, which is the HERO Connect, uh, the Forecast, Optimize, and Enhance. Uh, the first of these is the connect functionality. And so this is how Hero is actually able to, to connect to the various devices we talk to in the, in the field. This is both a, a software and a hardware solution. Uh, we do interface with several different vendors, uh, APIs, and, and we're showing uh, uh, an interface and an app that, that we built to interface with uh, a thermostat vendor to control demand, demand resources, obviously. Uh, we also have two flavors of these edge compute devices. Uh, these can continue to run when communications are down and, and uh, support dispatch of batteries or, or other assets um, as needed for, you know, for several days or weeks if needed. Uh, they also work as data loggers and collection and, and can interface directly with, with devices on the site. Um, the difference between the two flavors is, is one, I guess, is a little bit more rugged than, than the other one. Uh, so now that we have all the data, this is sort of the brains of, of Hero. Um, we typically, ha we have sort of our, our standard system level forecast. So we'll, we'll, we build forecasts for uh, generation, for load, um, for pricing and things like that. We also individually forecast the dispatch and capability of the assets that make up the hero bundle. Um, and so, so that's sort of how we can can provide an accurate uh, an accurate idea of the, the capability and the cost of that capability to a system operator or, or to a market. Uh, once we forecast those, those quantities, those are fed into an optimization algorithm. That optimization algorithm determines a cost, cost structure, cost schedule that, that is, provides the most benefit to the system operator and provides the most benefit to the, the uh, market participant uh, itself. Uh, this will then uh, feed back into the, the forecast uh, agent to, to allow us to forecast uh, the dispatch, which in turn goes back into the, the optimizer to uh, allow for uh, additional plans to be made further on. Uh, and then finally, we have the enhanced functionality. This is where you can kind of get a fleet level view of, of your assets or, or of your bundles of assets. Uh, you can view your assets by by uh, type of asset or, or by group. Um, and uh, you'll be able to pull up some metrics on how they're performing and how they're settling in, in different markets. Um, so uh, these are some examples of where we've implemented this and where this is working uh, to, to move on quickly, I guess. This, this first example is a hybrid asset uh, a wind and solar hybrid asset that's operating in a deregulated market. Uh, 
this asset is is very interesting because it the wind and and solar assets offer into the the market as as unique entities however on the control side and 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 uh on the metering side we are allowed to they are allowed to compensate each other for uh for the dispatch that's provided uh from the system operator for instance if the wind was dispatched for 100 megawatts uh we would be able to produce 110 megawatts with the wind and charge 10 megawatts with the energy storage um and so that that allows us to do some unique things with our our offer strategy and, and our planning, um, but it also allows us to do some some unique things on the on the control side. Um, and this one is up and running, so I have some screenshots I can show from that. Uh, this is sort of the the framework that we've built uh, that does the the forecasting and the optimization. Um, this is the this this is specific to this site, and it, it'll look slightly different for each site that this is implemented at. However, the basic structure is is roughly the same. Um, the the key to this is our our software engineers have designed this in a a really cool agent based framework, which allows us to to sort of plug and play different agents. So if you look at this, we have on the on the left, we have our, our forecasting agents up here. These feed into our, our planning agents, which actually submit the offers. Um, Production-wise, it could stop here. However, we also have built in simulation capabilities. So we have agents that mimic the system operator and agents that, that mimic uh, our, our assets themselves. But for instance, if, if you were to uh, develop the same uh, develop another algorithm, I guess, for another node in the in the same system. You might take out your price forecast, put in the new price forecast, and uh, and obviously change out your strategy, and then everything else is is essentially the same. Uh, so it it really helps with with scalability, and this is one of the key pieces of the the hero architecture. Once we have our our offers, we actually submit them uh, in an automated fashion via via an API. Um, with the, the market operator. At that point, uh, the market operator will clear us and then dispatch us appropriately. This is an example of the wind and the battery uh, dispatching in a, in a hybrid manner. Uh, the blue uh, curve here is, the, is the, the dispatch set point going to the wind asset, whereas the orange is the actual production. And, and you can see here that when the when the wind is dispatched uh, up or down in, in this case from what it can actually produce, the battery is actually firming the asset and, and uh, uh, picking up the difference here. Uh, the next part of this is to uh, to actually calculate the settlements. Sorry, Paul. I'm, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, settlements here. Uh, One minute warning. Thanks. And then uh, we also have, as I referred to earlier, the simulation capabilities uh, of HERO. So we can actually compare different strategies directly uh, over, over a time series. Uh, so that was, that was more of a traditional hybrid asset, wind and solar, um, without any distributed resources. We also, and, and this is uh, the last slide I have, but we're, we're currently building uh, for our utility uh, a a use case that that has just everything everything but the kitchen sink right we have uh, energy storage we have vehicle to grid electric buses we have thermostats and, and the idea is that we can aggregate any group of these things uh, and and supply them uh, with a, a a single cost curve to to run through unit commitment and and that's what I had so. Until Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Matt, and and thank you for staying on time. That was outstanding. I like that. And we already have a few questions coming in for you. So again, I want to remind everybody that if you want to ask the panelists questions, uh, you can go to slido.com and 
enter the code June, J-U-N-E 23, and that'll take you to uh, the page that where you can submit your questions for any of the panelists. So with that, let's move on to our next presentation with Hong Yu Wu from K-State. Hong Yu, the floor is yours. Okay, thank Paul for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, I would like to talk about some challenges and opportunities for DER markets and DRMP. Since this is a kind of a pretty large topic, I would like to talk about primarily from a modern perspective here. So uh, here's my outline. First, I want to talk about the DER and distribution market. Then I will focus on talking about a component-wise distribution locational marginal price model, GMP model, in the context of distribution market clearing. Next, I will present some simulation results on the IEEE 69 node distribution system. Finally, I will make a conclusion and talk about challenges and opportunities in applying the DRMP model in distribution market. Uh, as we all know, the power industry is undergoing this radical transformation, increasingly shifting away from fossil fuel to renewable energy. It is also widely acknowledged that we are going to have 100% renewable energy in the power grid, ultimately. The distribution grid is also quickly moving from the utility centric structure to a bottom-up proliferation of inverter-based BERs, electrification of transportation, community microgrid, Internet of Things, based smart home and smart energy, smart buildings, and also uh, all those challenges are basically the calling for the behind the meter market for residential and commercial needs. This is also reshaping, reshaping the all aspect of our industry, including electrical demand, distribution system operation, distribution planning, market, business model, and the utility regulation, etc. So to date, a DR value proposition does not yet quantify major benefits and values to the best of my knowledge. DER can shape new distribution level flexible load to the minimize uh, the challenges to system operation. DERs that are based on great forming inverters, such as solar and battery energy storage system, can bring in add-on resilience to distribution grid to withstand severe disruptions. And DER can also avoid costly peak load transmission and distribution infrastructure, and also defer the distribution level infrastructure upgrades. So figure one is basically showing the evolution of distribution market as you can see, DR levels and values in terms of customer adoption and engagement increase over time. The stage two distribution market is viewed most useful for integrating renewable energy resources. In this stage, DR and end customer become great resources through the behind meter markets. DR will have performance capability to provide energy and ancillary service at different spatial and temporal scales. So to this end, the distribution market will require redesign and cost causation pricing of those services. A natural research question is how to design and the marginal cost-based pricing mechanism here. So uh, similar to the concept of RMP in the bulk transmission market, DRMP has been introduced in the distribution grid in recent years. DRMP is a granular market measure of the marginal cost at a specific time and location of three core electricity products, including energy, reactive power, and reserves. DRMP is also uh, different from this administrative distribution tariff, such as fitting tariff, net metering, or RMP plus D, in that DRMP is based on the marginal cost and cost causation principle. Several research has attempted to introduce DRMP pricing either through the use of DC optimal power flow, DCOPF, or a variant of AC optimal power flow, ACOPF. Because of the lower XR ratio in the distribution system, the use of DCOPF has been shown with significant errors. In addition, the DCOPF does not include in this kind of a inherent features to including losses, voltage violation, and the reactive power pricing, which are crucial for distribution market. So here we model an approximation of ACOPF and determine four DRMP components, including energy loss, voltage violation, and congestion. So uh, this slide shows this component of this DRMP. As you can see, the real and reactive power DRMP is defined as summation of real and reactive energy loss, voltage violation, and congestion prices. The energy component of the DRMP is the shadow price of the real and reactive power balance constraint, which is the same as in the bulk power uh, market. The loss component is derived using the loss sensitivity with respect to the nodal power injection. Next, the voltage component is derived using the voltage sensitivity to the nodal power injection. 
Finally, the congestion component is computed using the you know, branches apparent power flow sensitivity with respect to the nodal power injection. So all this basically the uh, you know, notations and terms is introduced in our recent paper uh, you know, showed below here. So uh, based on the component-wise DRMP formulation, uh, a distribution market declaring model is basically uh, developed uh, you know, as a kind of prototype to minimize system operating cost in our research here. So this kind of model subject to basically is minimizing system operating cost, also subject to the prevailing constraints such as power balance constraint, linearized AC power flow constraint, losses, voltage limitation, generation, and demand constraints. And also the battery energy storage constraints such as SOC constraints can be modeled over there. And also, our model also have the three-phase balance constraint uh, in this kind of context. Similar to this wholesale market, this free market participant, uh, we uh, you know, place offers and bids in the segment. Here, we assume that the conventional DG place four segment offers, VRE sources such as wind and solar place zero price offers, a price responsible load also place segment bids, and BESS units place uh, the injection offers and extraction bids separately. So in order to study the different penetration level of the VRE, so we use a data-driven probability efficient uh, method, uh, point method, which is PEP method uh, here to determine VRE kind of penetration level in this case. So figure three shows the wind and solar penetration at 25% and 75% of the confidence interval based on historical VRE data set here. So uh, as such, uh, distribution market uh, clearing model is, you know, based on this kind of the uh, mixed integer, uh, mixed uh, integer linear programming is built. We test this model on a modified IEEE 69 node distribution system, which is shown in Figure 4. So in the system, node 60 has major, has majority of system demand, followed by nodes 61 to 64 with distributed PV. So uh, first, we uh, look at the simulation results from a uh, balanced system. Scenario one does not have any VRE, as you can see uh, in this figure. The top two plots in figure five show the real power DNP on the left and the reactive power DNP on the right. The deep blue bar shows the energy component, light blue bar the loss component, green bar shows the voltage component, uh, and the yellow bar shows the congestion component. And the red line, which is the summation of all the components, which is the real the uh, reactive power or DMP in this case. In scenario one, as you can see, due to the high demand, the voltage violation, which is occurred at node 64, and the congestion on uh, the line two occurs in this case. So this causes the voltage component in green and the congestion component in yellow appear during time uh, period in 16 to 18. These values represent the per unit price incurred to node 60 because the unit increase in real and reactive power consumption on this node will increase the voltage violation and power flow congestion. So in addition, the loss components are inherent and appear in all time slots. Here is kind of a, a, a minimum compared to others. Uh, because the losses are inevitable, meaning injection of any amount at the uh, node, uh, you will incur a transmission losses in this case, okay? And next, uh, in scenario two, we add a small penetration of VRE you can see from this button two plots that the congestion prices and the voltage violation prices during our 16 to 18 completely vanish. This is because the deployment of zero marginal cost VRE reduces the power flow burden on the congestion lines and serves the high demand at node 60 from node 61 to 64, where the high penetration of this renewable energy. So which is this, all this is leading to a smaller voltage drop and uh, remove this voltage violation prices. Uh, another advantage I want to mention using DRMP is that we can use this kind of price signal to encourage or kind of the discourage that uh, you know the phase balancing because we usually have unbalanced uh, you know three phase distribution system. As you can see, Figure six shows the simulation results on the same system with three phase heavily unbalanced DRs. The penetration of uh, the VRE are 28.5%, 2.6%, and 2.2% for phase A and B and C respectively. So this could be a kind of a potential future case where one phase of feeder serves single family homes capable of widespread rooftop PV, while others serve community apartment complex customers where roof, uh, where roof PV is uncommon, so in this case. So also figure six show that phase A with the high penetration, VRE penetration, uh, have zero real power DNP when the sun is shining, you can see from our pretty much from the eight to 17, you can see the zero DMP over there. 
So also the zero variable cost unit are the marginal cost in those hours, which is, uh, which is supplied in the next unit, uh, uh, unit of power in phase A. Also, you can see the negative voltage prices in green appears at some hours, indicating system voltage profile can be improved if more energy were to be consumed in this case. So the uh, challenge question when using a linear approximation of ACOPF model is basically understanding how close a linear model is to the true model. So therefore, we compare our model with a full ACOPF model in MET power. So figure seven shows the voltage, line flow, and the real power loss comparison. You can see the maximum you know, arrow are further summarized in this table on the right. The maximum arrow in the voltage of an end node in a feeder was about uh, 0.04%, which is pretty good. The maximum arrow in the line and the losses were 1.34% and 4.26% at the maximum loading in this case. So we think that the arrow is uh, insignificant and which is acceptable for this kind of approximation in this case. Uh, so to conclude, uh, you know, many opportunity can arise when using the DRMP mechanism with DRs. For example, DRMP is a cost causation price, uh, pricing mechanism. Whichever node create or relieve a great operational problem will pay or get paid according to its DRMP. DRMP enables marginal cost-based pricing, which can reflect a time and location-specific value to real and direct power. This mechanism could encourage and discourage power consumption at particular times of the day and particular location of the grid. Also, the uh, component-wise feature of DNP could provide you know, economic efficiency by offering a, clearing, a, a clear and kind of transparent price breakdown for all market participants. Uh, in addition, the DNP enables basically the market for grid services, which can help build DR commercial viability. For example, participation of VREs and BSs in distribution grid can be adequately rewarded for the services they provide to the distribution system. And currently, other administrative uh, tariffs do not reflect a real-time electricity price, to the best of my knowledge. And also, DRMP uh, mechanism, particularly reactive power pricing, uh, embrace smart inverter functionalities, such as the vault, uh, uh, vault of vault control and the vault and watt control, by rewarding the DRs for reducing um, the losses voltage violation and congestion, and this can uh, face imbalances. So also I want to mention a little bit about these challenges uh, facing this DRNP. Uh, these challenges especially comes uh, when we deal with this uncertainty VRE units. So especially for the real-time st system stability you know, study or kind of the, uh, uh, you know, to ensure that. So without any doubt, I think the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges can be uh, overcome by a better forecasting. So I think that's one topic of this, you know, this kind of workshop. So better forecasting will definitely significantly improve this uh, VRE, handling this VRE uncertainty. The second one, uh, here we use the data-driven probability efficient point method to deal with this issue. But there are a lot of other advanced models and approaches can be applied, uh, which were uh, applied in power uh, transmission system, which can be equivalently used in the distribution market. So figures uh, eight show this kind of advanced modeling with pros and cons in the market efficiency and computational requirement. Uh, in addition, like other, uh, any other modeling approach, an important issue to be addressed is how best to achieve high modeling accuracy while maintaining this basically modeling scalability and robustness. This is crucial for problems with practical size. And also, uh, we may have other considerations in the distribution market due to the complexity of future active, uh, active distribution market, uh, how to incorporate other incentive mechanisms such as, uh, for example, the you know, revenue uh, sufficiency guarantee and stuff like that can be another challenge. And but, uh, last but not least, due to the radical distribution grid, an inherent drawback of a DRMP is a spatial variation. When the grid is under stress, the DRMP-based pricing charges you know, remote nodes at a higher rate than those closer to the substation. This is going to be a great issue for this DRMP. So in particular, if we observe that the impact of location is very high, uh, uh, if the extreme, extreme node has an under voltage issue. So those issues need to be, uh, you know, challenges need to be addressed in this kind of a, uh, appropriate uh, market design. So uh, that's pretty much uh, my presentation. So I'll be happy to take any question at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Wu. I was about ready to tell you that your time was up and you were spot on time. Thank you so much. Um, okay.
And now we'll move on to our last presentation with Mark Alstrom. Again, I'll remind you, slido.com uh, with the code June 23 to ask questions for on you. We've got many for Matt already. Mark, the floor is yours, batting cleanup. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, uh, yeah, this is definitely a cleanup because I think what we've seen very clearly uh, from Hong Yu is the, the complexity of networks and getting the prices right on these complex networks that he was talking about in terms of adding in the distribution system. And we certainly saw, you know, from Matt, the sophistication and analytics, the communications and control that has to go into putting a, a more integrated interface on top of these networks. And I wanted to kind of step back and, and look at, you know, how do we actually make all this complexity of these growing networks be, be useful? I would remind everybody that there's a clear analogy here. We're all standing here right in front of our screens connected to the internet, right? The same sort of complexity is throughout the internet, all the way from the central computing to the edge computing, to the network management, to the redundancy and so forth. But yet we're able to actually use services at, of the internet like what we're doing right now through a, a fairly elegant and simple interface, right? In other words, we're kind of making some of that complexity other people's problems. Not that it's not important complexity, it has to be done right, like we just heard from Hong Yu. And we have to have ways of, of actually operating it, you know, as a system to provide services like we heard from Matt. But how are we going to manage that? Because the, uh, you know, the power grid itself is becoming much more of an internet-like network. So uh, one way of looking at this, uh, I mean, I, the, other, the other thing, of course, is what they, what they really have described here, whether it's an aggregation of DERs or, uh, or, or Matt's general case with, with Hero, these are really virtual power plants, right? So I'm going to talk about one particular, even slightly simplified version of a, of a virtual power plant, which I call a hybrid resource. And talking about this because this is something that's currently being discussed with all the system operators now in terms of you know, how can, uh, can we actually do like a combination of solar and storage or storage and a natural gas plant? So the definition of hybrid that uh, we, we helped roll out about a year ago, just over a year ago now, and is, is currently being discussed in all the, the ISO RTOs, is, you know, a, a hybrid would be a combination of multiple technologies that are physically and electronically controlled by the plant owner operator, not, not, not too much by the system operator, but by you know, it's your plant, you're going to actually operate it at the point of interconnection and offer it as a single resource to the system operator or to some other customer, even though it has a, real, a combination of different technologies and analytics and software and controls all inside it. Uh, and it, it's the single resource that's an important part of this conceptually. Now, you can co-locate resources, and people are doing that for other reasons. I mean, you can have a storage plant and a, and a PV plant or a gas plant that just happen to connect at the same point of interconnection. Uh, but I would call that co-located uh, as opposed to hybrid. And we'll, we'll see a quick example of that in a moment. I would also point out that to me, a true hybrid resource is really central around the sort of intelligent agent type approach that Matt discussed here, right? You internalize all the complexity of characteristics of those different components and you offer the services you know, like a conventional resource, but with more flexibility. So you, you basically make it look like it's just a really flexible general power plant, even though it, it has all this, this complexity and sophistication inside. And you do that by the coordinated use of the energy storage, the power electronics, and the software technologies, very much like what Matt was describing through the, the Hero platform. You know, to say it even more simply, what I'm really saying here is that given sufficient energy storage, electronics, and software, we can emulate any kind of electrical machine you want to see as viewed from the other side of the point of interconnection. Therefore, you know, why not make it be a simpler, more elegant one in terms of how you want it to be viewed? A, quick, a couple of quick examples here, borrowing some slides from a friend at Fluence. Uh, what we're building a lot of on the system in the U.S. right now is a combination of, of PV and, and battery storage. The first way you think about doing that is on the left here, right, where you say, well, I've got a, a solar plant with its inverter. I've got a battery with its inverter, and I'm just going to connect them at the same point, and I'm maybe going to use the plant controller logic to uh, treat them as a single resource at the point of interconnection. 
Uh, now, very large. You know, in most cases, uh, the the uh, the actual size in terms of the the nameplate of the solar and the battery would exceed the interconnection limit. You know, so if you just use these as kind of co-locating, you're almost creating another constraint. Uh, but if you operate them together as a single resource, you can add flexibility in the way that Matt was kind of describing. In in practice, though, we actually are much more interested in uh, in building DC couple meaning that I not only want to disconnect them at the same point, I actually want them to, in many cases, share the same inverter that connects to the grid at that point of interconnection. And here on the right, we're seeing a DC couple design where the, the PV and the battery are actually sharing the inverter. That DC converter is in there really just because the solar panels and the batteries typically operate at slightly different voltages, but it doesn't really do too much, uh, really. It, it's, the key point here is that you've got you know, these various components that are behind a single a single power plant, right? Now, why, why might this DC design actually be increasingly important? Uh, well, if you're going to oversize like the PV plant, uh, you can actually do a lot with the extra energy by using the storage and the software and electronics there, basically. Uh, if you're doing a standalone PV plant, we already oversized the DC side to some extent, meaning for a 100 megawatt solar plant, a standalone solar plant, we would probably build in about 130 megawatts of solar panels on the DC side, and we would only be delivering a maximum of 100 megawatts at the point of interconnection in terms of the power load. If we actually put the PV and the batteries on that DC side, we would often oversize the, the PV panels by much more, maybe by 80 to 100 percent. So you might have 180 megawatts of PV panels for a 100 megawatt plant, and you might have an 80 megawatt battery with four hour duration there as well. And why do you do that? Well, you actually get the shoulder effects there where you get a, a better PV plant in terms of its capacity factor. But all that energy above the limit, you know, is no longer wasted because you can use it to store and charge the battery. And then you can shift the, uh, the capabilities from that battery with the electronics to other time periods or other services, right? So you have to look at these in terms of how they optimize together when you're doing this. And you can also do this with a gas plant, for example. You could put battery storage with a natural gas uh, combined cycle plant. And you can say, I now want this to be a gas plant that starts instantly and can ramp all the way down to zero, even though a standalone gas plant can't do that. And you do that by the combined coordinated use of the battery with the gas plant. Same thing. So what are the benefits of kind of stepping back and looking at a virtual power plant as a hybrid resource in this way? Well, if you can emulate essentially any kind of resource you want, if you do it all right with the software and everything, you know, why not make it look like a, a resource that is familiar to us, but more flexible and has more control? So that would be like a renewable plant, plant that can provide all of the other ancillary services and, and, and reliability services and reserves without having to self curtail energy in order to have the space, the headroom to do that, right? I can use the, the, the source of the generation and the storage together in a way to do that. And it turns out a lot of the services actually end up being done by the battery rate of charge or discharge and not by the generator anymore. Same with a gas plant. Uh, same sort of concept. A lot of it is actually now shifted over to the storage side so that I can get increasing flexibility from the, the you know, the basic characteristics of the generation itself. The second way is that, you know, these batteries are, are, uh, are they're, they're a huge deal. We're doing tons of battery projects, right? And there's a lot of debate still going on under uh, FERC Order 841 in terms of how these batteries are going to participate in the market. I mean, the reality is, I think we're finding out that batteries are great, but managing batteries is very difficult, very complicated, especially with the degradation, especially with the state of charge, where you want it to end up at the end of the hour and so forth. So the big debate here is, you know, should the system operator be doing that or should the battery owner be doing that kind of indirectly through the services that they offer, not by saying, yeah, you can use my battery, Mr. ISO RTO. But by the end of this hour, I need to have the state of charge at, at 76%. You know, is that really the most important thing for the system operator to be worrying about, or should that be encapsulated inside the hybrid by the owner operator? Uh, and secondly, if you're a real market wonk, like I think uh, I know that, that Paul and James and I are, uh, 
you look at this and you say, you know, we could actually simplify markets if we do this right, because a hybrid that I'm talking about is actually making what they call a single part offer here, right? I don't have any startup cost. I don't have any minimum RON. I, I don't have any min gen. I can start instantly. I can ramp all the way from zero to the, the max capability. So you can actually, if you do this right, come up with a highly flexible resource that actually is making a simpler market offer. And I would actually argue that, you know, conceptually with storage, you know, any of the resources that we have could become hybrids if we really wanted them to be, or they could get services for it. You know, so at least in the long run, as more of these resources become, you know, inverter-based technologies, certainly with storage being very, very common, uh, we might actually be able to get uh, substantial market improvements in this way and simplifications. I'd also point out that I think it actually motivates the hybrid owner operator to do the right thing even more and to use the best forecasts. For example, we've talked about probabilistic forecasts of wind and solar for years. They're difficult to use in the market sense in terms of the large system operator. But if I'm running an operator the way that Matt was talking, running hybrid the way that Matt was talking about it here, I actually need to have very good forecasts and probabilistic information about how sure I am of the generation from the renewable side, because that is part of the optimization about how I use the storage and what software, what services I'm going to offer through my software for various times. And that becomes part of the optimization, including everything about you know, the battery degradation, the PV forecast, for example. You're very motivated to use very sophisticated analytics and controls like Matt discussed, right? Battery degradation, opportunity cost of batteries, how I'm going to be sure I can provide the services that I'm cleared for. I'm basically arguing here that those should become the responsibility of the hybrid owner operator and encapsulate it in that interface so that it provides a simpler interface to the market and to the rest of the world. And I think by doing that, actually, there's a big, a big driver here, which is, you know, if, if I can have more flexibility to improve my analytics and controls and even my hardware, you know, if I want to add in more batteries or change the technology a bit on my side of the point of interconnection, that continuous innovation is a benefit. We're seeing that in all other industries, right? I mean, Apple can put new code in my phone, you know, tomorrow and I've got a better phone, right? Now, obviously, we have to do it right in terms of reliability and everything, but there's lots of benefits to this. So in closing here, I just, you know, the, the key points that I'm trying to make is that there is a way to put an elegant, powerful interface on this. We have to figure out who is responsible for what, right? So with this generation storage electronics and software, you can emulate essentially any kind of machine you want. With the intelligent agent model that, that Matt described, uh, you know, you're really internalizing all that complexity and providing it through a much simpler interface. I'm proposing here with hybrids going into markets that at least as a starting point, we can make them look like a conventional resource, but one that is more flexible and has fewer constraints. Therefore, we can reduce the amount of market software that has to be changed, and we can use existing markets and, and software. This is a form of virtual power plant, and what we're saying by that, and what you heard also from from uh, Hong Yu, is uh, you know what we're really after here is what do the services look like at the margin, because that's what affects the rest of the system, the rest of the world. What's the interface effect? How it's done behind the curtain? We have all kinds of engineering and optimization ways of doing that. And we have to you know, decide whose job is it. I would say, you know, really, you, know, you focus on your job, we'll focus on our job. You know, the way we've kind of done it with some of the conventional plants historically, when you look back, you say, okay, I'm going to build this conventional plant. And I'm almost like tossing the keys over to the system operator and say, I built this plant, you run it. You tell you tell it when to dispatch, how to do it, and all that. Because you know, I, I'm just here to sell energy, right? So that's kind of like the internet. You know, the the processing is just a small part of the internet. What happens? You know, the real value is in the network and the services, right? And I'm arguing that we're going to move that direction with the power grid as well. We have to worry about paying for performance. The, you know, deciding what are the right services that have to be there. How are they going to be priced in the market? And we have to allow innovation to continue. 
bottom line, you know, I think that the power systems and power markets aren't as unique as we think they are. We've seen this with all other industries as they become digital, as they become, you know, in this network type model, that uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, very similar to what we've seen there eventually, because we can't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of devices like we're talking about here on the on the grid that are all interacting and expect, you know, every one of those to be separately optimized, you know, by the system operator. So with that, you know, this is a topic that's been discussed at ESIG for quite a while now. There is a paper that's up in our, our uh, website there if you want to see kind of the origin of the thoughts around some of this. Uh, you know, but that's, uh, and, and by the way, there, there are active stakeholder proceedings literally with, with all of the ISO RTOs right now about the details about how we're kind of moving in this direction, uh, at least in, in, uh, in general, in fits and starts, and it's, you know, it's a process. So thanks so much. I look forward to the discussion. Mark, thank you. And thank you for reminding us that those of us who work in power systems, engineering, or in, in power markets, I think we're all residents of Lake Wobegon. My idea being in, in Minnesota there, Mark, uh, where all the women are beautiful and everybody's above average. <laughs> um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Pigeon from New York ISO. And Jim, Jim and I have worked together before on a lot of distributed energy resource stuff and metering and demand response uh, going back a few years now. And uh, Jim, you've actually got the hard part because you've got to sit through a heck of a lot of questions here. And so I'm going to remind people that if they haven't gotten questions to Mark, go ahead and, and put those in. But Jim, the floor is yours and I'll let you run it all. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're, you're right. This job is uh, a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. There's a bunch of questions here, but uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first one is for regarding HERO and how it co-optimizes the benefits to the system operator and to the asset owners. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Stephen. So so thanks. And uh, and I think. There were a couple other questions about how the optimization actually works, so I'll try to I'll try to cover both of those with this answer. Um, so it, it it doesn't actually Hero doesn't act like a uh, a unit commitment for the entire system, right? The the way it's trying to provide the most benefit to the system operator is is by providing the most accurate cost curves to the system operator uh, for this this group of resources, and and so. In that sense, I think it's really the system operator is getting getting the most benefit from the tool. That the asset owners, on the other hand, we are uh, we are building our 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 uh, battery plan or a battery strategy or or hybrid asset strategy, I guess, um, to maximize the value to the asset owners uh, and the the returns they'll get. We have a bunch of, or we have several different optimization method, methods. I guess we can we can use here. Um, the simplest of which is is uh, sort of a linear program that that picks uh, which services and and which uh, how the device should operate based on our forecast and our forecast uncertainty. Um, so so we have that, but we've also built out a couple of other features. That take uh, make use of the the fact that we have the simulation framework, so we can we can do some some interesting things with reinforcement learning algorithms to allow these these offers to get better um, as we go and as we get more settlement data and as we we sort of continue to simulate. Um, so I, ho I hope that answers that question. Um, yeah, and, and so would you say that it's it's some of the onus is on the asset owner to to structure their offers in a way to you to help optimize how they might get used, and if they're looking to be used more, they should structure their bids appropriately. That's exactly right. Yeah, it, we're we're trying to to indicate that with our with our offers. Okay. All right. So now the next one's for Hong Yu regarding the DLNP model and how it assumes the D system topology in, in regards to being static versus in reality where it's an actual moving system, and how is that handled? Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, it's, uh, so in our preliminary work uh, uh, now, we just assume that uh, the distribution system is kind of static. 
So there's no kind of a switching or uh, you know the uh, network reconfiguration in place here. But I think uh, if that uh, you know factor is taken into account, so the approach we are using right now is capable of handling that because all the sensitivities uh, you know which is calculated based on this kind of linearized ACLP model. So if this kind of topology change or switch changes, we can you know accordingly change this uh, you know the sensitivity, and then we can use the same basically based on shadow price of this power balance constraint, maybe the shadow price of voltage violation to calculate this kind of the uh, price. But of course, you know those changes will introduce kind of a, uh, a large kind of computation overhead uh, if we have to change that uh, you know very frequently. Uh, but that's a very good question. I think that uh, can be. Uh, further taking into account in our future work. Thank you. Yeah. And and kind of jump into one of the next ones, I think that dovetails right into that. How many uh, nodes are you currently solving for at a max level? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. We started the not uh, very long ago, this kind of work. So the current system we're using is 69 bus system, 69 uh, node system, which is kind of still kind of uh, very small. Uh, we have like 559 bus system at hand. And also some other system which is uh, we uh, want to look into. So that's basically we uh, we want to do next a little bit kind of information on the simulation and time or solution time for this distribution system. For the 69 bus system, we take like 80, 80 seconds, basically one minute and a half or so, to uh, you know clear the market to come up with this kind of uh, DNP. Okay, thank you. And uh, for Mark. From a system operator point of view, are you considering any resource aggregation concerns? And is there any uh, concerns around the resource visibility? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, part of the reason why we're doing all this is to actually essentially increase the value of the various components. And it's the, the basic argument here is that the, you know, that the sum is greater than the value of the individual parts by the time you're done if you do the right analytics and control around this. Uh, so an example, you know, is, well, how do you make the offers with something like this, right? How do you, how certain are you? I mean, the key concept is suppose you've got variable PV and you've got storage and you want to offer some combination of energy and ancillary services, right? I mean, you can come up with ways, you know, using your opportunity cost of the battery, using how confident you are in a PV forecast for that hour or that period and so forth. You could come up with a combination of services and energy that you could offer the system operator for them to clear, right? Now you have to come up with your own risk analysis around am I, you know, am I confident at least up to the equivalent of a fourth outage of a conventional unit that I can actually provide that if I'm cleared for this, this combination of these services. So the analytics is daunting. As you heard from Matt though, we, you know, we think it's quite doable. Uh, you know, the initial impression I get with a lot of system operators is, well, it's, it feels inefficient. Well, yeah, but if I can now offer a combination of services that I feel I'm confident will provide higher overall value at least in the long run, you know, what does efficiency mean? I mean, I'm talking about, you know, total value here. So, I mean, that's how I look at it is you, you, you still have to deal, somebody has to deal with the uncertainty of wind and solar, right? Uh, who should that be? And at what point does it flip over where it's actually better to have the hybrid operator do that than the system operator? You know, it, it, there's benefits both ways, and we're looking for the right middle ground on this, but that's the concept. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna toss one back to Hong Yu here and taking a look at uh, DLM, DLMP and how it integrates with uh, security constrained economic dispatch. Uh, how are the, the bids of the wholesale suppliers used to, to factor into the DLMP pricing, if so? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, this is thanks, Eric, for this question. I didn't uh, make it clear. So actually, you know, uh, we in the TV system, we always have a substation and also the energy coming from this uh, transmission grid. So in our work, we take this uh, as an infinite source for the system. So this kind of uh, you know energy from the transmission, which is actually bid at the LNP price from the transmission market. So the quantity can be, you know, uh, very large or there's no limit, but the price is basically based on the RNP from transmission system. So in this case, your SCED or other kind of bids is going to impact the RNP from the market, the uh, transmission market. So I think that's basically the link between the transmission and the distribution uh, in our current model. I don't know if I uh, clear, make this clear in, in this uh, 
answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll try and squeak in one more question here. Uh, cybersecurity concerns around Hero. Have yeah. you guys thought about that and dealt with that? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, most of Hero operates uh, on, on cloud-based resources. Um, so we, we do have cybersecurity concerns. I am I am probably not the best person to talk through all of those, unfortunately. But um, it's, I, I think I included my email address in the, at the beginning of the presentation. I'm happy to, to uh, follow up on that. Um, but we we do have we are interfacing directly with our our corporate network and and have a lot of uh, cyber security uh, nuances to jump through for for that. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. That brings us right to three o'clock. Charlie? Actually, I was hoping that Charlie might might uh, let the session chair indulge in a couple more questions here. If we could go if we could go through that. I mean, I don't want to keep people beyond. I know that uh, everybody's got things to do at three o'clock, or many people do, but we do have a lot sure. of really good questions here. Sure, sure Paul. If people want to hang on and uh, go through a few more questions, you know, let's go ahead and see how the uh, how the attendance uh, holds up there. Sounds great. And and Jim, sorry to make you work a little bit harder, but let's let's try to uh, squeeze in a couple more questions quick. Sure. Did you have a particular one that you were looking to get through, or? No, I was gonna I was gonna give it to you. I wanted to. Um, there's a couple questions here from Mark. I'm looking here. So I'll I'll, I'll take one there. Uh, regarding forecasts for hybrid and renewables, how good have you looked at? How good that is currently and where we're going to need to get to to run an efficient system well yeah we've been of course we've been working on on forecasting wind and solar for uh oh, 20 years here uh at, at the wind logics group that is now next to analytics uh, you know they're they're gradually getting better and uh you know there's there's going to be uncertainty it's it's extremely good over the next you know five to ten minutes so in terms of how you're going to deal with operation between your like your PV and your your battery for short term reserves and so forth is is quite good. The uncertainty, of course, increases with time in general with weather based forecasts. You know, so you get into well, how much you're going to offer day ahead, how you're going to do that. I mean, those are all part of the part of the risk and analytics you go into. But actually, even with standalone renewables, you know, a lot of that actually is offered into the day ahead market at this point, and we use the benefits of the market to deal with that. But the key point is that once you add storage and the analytics and software, you actually are able to, to mitigate that uncertainty around the forecast and take advantage of the actual probability distribution. There might be some times where you're actually quite certain about how much energy you'll have you know, from the, the wind or from the sun. There are other times where you might be the same megawatt value, but you might have much more uncertainty because of the weather circumstances. And that can be picked up by state-of-the-art forecasts. The question is, you know, you can't, you know, often we can't actually express that to the system operator through standard offers, but we can do that in terms of our internal analytics in terms of, well, then I'm, then I'm going to offer these kind of services rather than that, you know? You know, for example, I'm willing more to, to offer reserves where I have the flexibility in my battery to say, well, I could charge or discharge the battery if I end up with extra energy from the, the wind or the sun. Now, I'm just going to charge the battery faster. That's not a bad thing. I'm you know, almost getting paid to, to charge the battery. You know, so the, the key point is the combination actually can offset a lot of the uncertainty and allow us to use more sophisticated probabilistic forecasts and analytics. So then, Mark, just to add on to that, I guess as markets move, and, and if markets move towards more Uber real-time markets where we can actually submit offers in in more close to to when the dispatch will actually happen, that that will alleviate some of that forecast uncertainty and allow for a more efficient uh, dispatch. The other point I would add too about markets, and this has come up actually, uh, like like James in in New York ISO discussions and elsewhere, is that you know right now with wind and solar, we kind of you know the system operator often does a rolling five minute forecast and just kind of allows that to go into the dispatch. I mean, in a sense, we're trying to with hybrids, I think, make all of this be more technology agnostic. That you know. Any, any highly flexible resource maybe should be able to provide an intra-hour update to what their capabilities are, regardless of what type of technology they are. And by, by the hybrid approach, we're actually getting that flexibility where it could be combined with any kind of generator. 
and actually allow us to to take full advantage of the capabilities you know they had you know hour ahead uh, real time and and intra hour adjustments to that as well yeah and that's, that's an interesting point you bring up i know it's one of the the current topics we're actually working through these days now is uh, hybrid storage and right. trying to separate that concept from how we handle uh VERs today where we do all the forecasting and we don't necessarily gain a benefit from uh firming up the intermittent with a, a storage device like some of the other ISOs and market areas do. And so it's an interesting topic to see how this is all going to unfold. It, it's an interesting thing though, Jim, that you know, thanks to folks at New York ISO like like Eric Eli when he was there coming up with how can you actually get wind into the five minute dispatch. It's amazing how comfortable we become with variable generation in terms of how the, R the ISO RTOs are treating it. Uh, and, and now we're kind of finding, well, there might be other ways that are analogous, but you know, it, it gets complicated because you're used to dispatching the wind and the sun now. If you add storage, are you kind of deviating from the renewable forecast? And how do you deal with that? Even though you might be making a more in a sense, perfect resource for you, right? But it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. Absolutely, yes. That's one of the questions we ask ourselves all the time right now. <laughs> so uh, let's see here. Uh, I saw a couple more LMP questions that had piqued my... I was going to say, I think we're starting to lose participants, Jim, so okay. we can make it quick. I'm watching here as they dwindle, they, they fall off. Okay. Uh, I guess the last one then was... Uh, Considering that uh, you, we would require a change in regulation for distribution pricing, uh, have you looked at some alternative solutions that might use just long-term flat rate contracts? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. For me or um, for? Yep. Uh, no, okay. for Hunter. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, first, the alternative solution of automation along with long-term flat rate, I'm not quite uh, uh, you know, clear about this context. Maybe that's another option. But I think the you know the primary advantage of this DNP is basically that uh, the marginal cost uh, you know pricing. So basically, based on cu uh, current condition in the system, so the next incremental power or rate power, how that is going to be paid or get paid or something like that. So that's the beauty of DNP. And another thing for uh, DNP, as you, we demonstrate in our case study, is that. Uh, it's basically cost causation pricing, whichever basically caused this basically issue for this uh, system, uh, they're gonna have, uh, pay for those kind of the uh, consequence or something like that. So I think that's the, uh, you know, a lot of research, uh, including me, I see a lot of experts uh, uh, today, uh, you know, may have different kind of comments or something. So I'm looking into the DME pricing, but I think, uh, you know, because this is actually still an open question, uh, different researchers in industry and academia, or, or kind of looking into this uh, issue, uh, I think, uh, you know, at least DNP is going to be a promising issue for this uh, distribution system and pricing, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Hong Wu, for wrapping this up. And Jim, thank you for uh, curating the questions here. Um, now that we've lost just about half the people where we had at peak, I think I'm going to go ahead and close here, Charlie. I appreciate your uh, indulgence and for everybody who's still on. Um, I want to thank everybody for the great presentations we had today and for the discussion and the questions. Uh, as, as Mark said, it's really timely, and it's nice to see that technology is finally catching up with markets uh, rather than trying to fit markets into technology. So I, I, as an economist, I love to see that. Um, there's still two more technical sessions that we're going to hold for the remainder of the month here. Uh, the full session is on the, the ISIG website. Um, and everybody obviously is, is invited to attend. It's free of charge. But the next session is co-sponsored by the IEA Wind Task Force 36 with updates on best practices and tools for forecasting. That's going to be this week on Thursday, June 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So for those of you on the West Coast, good morning, 8 a.m. Thank you very much for your participation. I hope you all stay safe and sane in these crazy times. And thank you very much for attending and for your participation. Take care. Thank you. Where's Frankie, though?